This video is made possible by Practical Defense Systems, the best online security training at the lowest prices. You can start your security career today online at pdsclasses.com. Check them out. Hi, I'm Joel Persinger. I'm the Gun Guy. Thank you very much for everything that you do to help me keep this going at Gun Guy TV. I'm very, very grateful for you. So please, if you haven't already subscribed, I urge you to do that. I would also suggest that you check us out on these other alternative locations because YouTube is <laughs> pretty sketchy a lot. So Rumble, BitChute, those would be better places for you to go, I think. Although YouTube has been leaving me alone lately, so you just never know. But again, it's it's iffy. So at least now you know you can find me in these other places. You might also check out the Gun Guy TV Firearms Podcast. That's a regular podcast I do with Rick Travis and Sam Paredes. And uh, I might even invite Sean Maloney from Second Call Defense at some point. You never know. We have some great discussions, and that is available on your favorite podcast player as well as Rumble. Uh, lastly, I would mention that you might also check out the Practical Defense Systems channel, which is my other channel. That's where I make a living is with my business, Practical Defense Systems. I put a lot of training videos up there. So those might be interesting for you. And that is all in the description. You'll find the links there. Today, we're going to talk to Sean Maloney from Second Call Defense. He's a, um, a longtime experienced attorney. We're going to talk about constitutional carry and the march of constitutional carry across the United States. We keep on adding states. It looks like we might add Florida and South Carolina sometime time soon, I hope. I think that'll take us to 27. I'm not quite keeping track, but that might be close. If I'm wrong, please uh, put in the comments what the correct number is. We're also going to talk about California a little bit in more specific, uh, probably we'll talk a lot about San Jose because San Jose has an ordinance which is troubling. It's requiring people to have insurance. All right, now that I've told you what we're going to talk about, the video's over. Uh, have a great day. No, we got Sean here. So we're going to get uh, Sean squared away and we'll talk with Sean a bit. Sean, thank you very much for joining me. I really do appreciate it. It's always a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Oh, absolutely. And I love your uh, background of your office there. And rather than mine, you look like you're sitting in the courthouse. So that's pretty cool. Mine's mine. I'm, I'm in the, in the bunker here in the people socialist Republic of California where I have to hide away or they'll come and take me and put me in the, in the nut house. <laughs> anyway, so you've been kind of keeping track of some things. We have talked about the San Jose um, uh, insurance deal, but I think before we talk about that, I would like to talk about um, the stuff going on with constitu what, what I would call a constitutional carrier, permitless carrier, whatever, that's marching across the country and how that is affecting the insurance business and what you're seeing as far as the Bruin case and what it's doing to gun control throughout the country. You have more of a national view of it than I do. It's all good stuff. When we start looking about and talking about constitutional carry and permanent carry, uh, it's almost like a blitzkrieg of action. It's been uh, in Ohio, for example, we just passed that earlier uh, in the middle of last year, probably. And two years ago, if you would have told me that we would have constitutional carry or permanent carry in Ohio, I would tell you you're nuts. We had barely even been talking about it. We just removed the duty to retreat. Uh, we had a long ways to go. And then suddenly uh, the right people were in the House and the Senate and the right people acted. And uh, as with all these other states, quickly, you know, we get constitutional carry or permitless carry. Uh, it's pretty exciting. And I think you're right. We're probably at 27, uh, approaching 30 uh, before we know it. Uh, and actually, it makes things a lot easier. And of course, all the naysayers scream. Uh, you know, everybody will be shooting each other. You'll have people out there with no training, no experience to carry firearms. And I've always been of the, of the view, uh, looking and reviewing all the data from these other states, that accidental shootings or shootings don't go up in these states that have permitless or constitutional carry. And mostly, whether you have a permit state or a permitless state, it really doesn't matter because we as, as law-abiding citizens and gun owners, if we're not comfortable carrying a gun, we're not going to carry a gun. And uh, that's why training and education is so important no matter what we do. But even in the state of Ohio, when all the naysayers were saying, uh, that, you know, the sky is falling and there'll be accidental shootings everywhere, it just doesn't happen. It hasn't happened in West Virginia. It didn't happen next door in Kentucky. There's no reason to think that uh, it, it's going to happen in Ohio or anywhere else where they enact this legislation. Are you seeing resistance in some of these states where it is passed? Are you seeing that uh, some of the some of the anti-gunners are stepping in to try to argue with it, even though it's been passed and become law? Usually, what happens, and, and there may be an outlier out there that I'm aware of, 
But once uh, it's settled and it's law, the naysayers go away. There's never any reason for them to come back and point their fingers and say, see, I told you so. So mostly speaking, when these things pass, uh, their fight is over and they're going to go on to the next thing where they think they can get some traction. And there's always going to be blood running in the streets. Uh, it's always going to be Dodge City. I can remember when we passed uh, restaurant carry in Ohio. Uh, if, you, if, you know, if you're a concealed carry holder, you can carry your firearm into a restaurant or into a bar if you don't drink. Well, that was going to be the end of everything. That's been two and a half years now, and nothing has happened. So, again, nobody says anything about it anymore because there's no problem. Now, has this affected the insurance industry, the industry that you're in? I, I guess, I, do you call it insurance? Or is no, it we're, really not, we're really not insurance, although we have an insurance-like product. Uh, we're a membership organization that provides legal protection and civil protection for someone who force use of firearm and self-defense. And that important distinction is if you are considered to be insurance in the United States, Insurance cannot provide benefits to somebody who's a defendant in the criminal case. And make no mistake about it, once you use a firearm in self-defense, you are the defendant. I mean, the victim, unfortunately, is the bad guy. But if you're the one, we have to all be called something. So the good guy with the gun that's forced to, to use that, that firearm is considered the defendant. And the person that kicked your door in and is now laying in your foyer, they're the victim. Uh, and so because we have an affirmative defense of self-defense, but we're defendants when we, when we start out. Am I the defendant because I have essentially confessed by saying I defended myself and shot the guy and now they have to determine whether I did so appropriately or not? Or why is it that I, I'm now the defendant? I guess that's what I'm trying to figure out. Well, you, you stated it pretty closely. Uh, look at it this way. Uh, whenever you shoot somebody or you kill somebody, that's a homicide. Even if I legally and had a reason to do it. So I shot somebody, I injured somebody, I assaulted somebody with my firearm because I was uh, protecting myself. Well, that's an affirmative defense. I, you're saying I did it. I shot that person, but I had a reason, and it was self-defense. I was in fear of death or serious bodily injury or harm. I had no choice. Yeah, I don't want to. I want to make sure that we're putting the nuts and bolts together because this can get super confusing. Right. Homicide is not necessarily murder. Homicide right. is just the legal term for the killing of a human being. Correct. It's an intentional so, killing of another person. Yeah, you killed a human being, and that's a homicide. Now, that could be an, a justifiable homicide or an unjustifiable homicide. In other words, it could be I murdered the person, which Correct. would be unjustifiable, or I I accidentally killed them, but the accident was my fault, so now I'm in some version of manslaughter, or maybe I killed them intentionally, but I didn't have malice of forethought, so now I'm in manslaughter maybe, depending right. on the state I'm in. But then there's I'm defending my wife, defending my family, or self-defense. That's, that's a justifiable homicide am i getting that right that's correct you okay know, so if can... that's the case when people hear that i know when i until i kind of started going through this a little bit mm -hmm. when i would hear the word homicide i immediately thought murder that's a crime mm -hmm. but it isn't necessarily no that's just that's a homicide is simply uh, an, an intentional killing of another human being now uh in, when i intentionally kill somebody i hold my firearm i press the trigger to save my own life, I took another life because I had no other choice. That's a homicide, but I have an affirmative defense of self-defense, meaning that I was in fear of death or serious bodily injury harm. These people were trying to kill me or hurt me seriously. So legally, I had the right to defend my life or the life of another. Bang, bang, bang. It's over now. This dude is on the deck. I'm still standing there. Fortunately, I'm not injured. Now I have to call the police. So I call the police. What, what do I do from that moment? I've called the police and I've said what? And then where do I go from there? Essentially, and, and, and we instruct our, our members to say there's been a shooting. I was in fear for my life. Send the ambulance and police. And then hang up. And then your second call should be the second call defense where 99% of the time I'm going to answer the phone unless I'm on an airplane or, or somewhere else. But then we'll have another attorney that will, that will answer the phone. And we'll talk to you before the police get there or when the police are there. I've talked to dozens of people while they've been sitting in the back of the cruiser for two hours while the police are conducting an investigation of the crime scene. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk to our members immediately, advise them of their rights, and talk to the police officers uh, if uh, warranted. And then our defense begins immediately on that occasion. And then 
If they're arrested for whatever reason, we provide immediate assistance for bail. Call your emergency contact, get you bailed out of jail, and uh, pay a retainer. Uh, recommend the best attorneys in the area where the shooting took place. You may not be home, so you don't know who that best attorney is. You're on vacation. So we'll give you a list of attorneys. We'll contact that attorney for you. We'll pay that attorney and get them started on your defense. All right. So let's talk about constitutional carry briefly, and then we'll talk about – I have a couple questions about that. And then we'll talk about the San Jose thing, because I know if you're watching this, waiting for the San Jose thing, you're about ready to strangle me because I have taken too long to get to it, and I apologize. No, no, no. No, I'm not talking about you. Oh, I'm talking, talking about, about everybody listening to somebody us. somebody that's watching who's going, come on, Joel, I want to know about this. I live in San Jose. I totally get it. Okay, so hold it. Well, that's what the little red line on the bottom of the video is for. So you can <laughs> kind of cheat and go forward to that if you want to do it. All right, constitutional carry. Carrie, obviously, a, a few things are happening since Bruin that don't even aren't even constitutional carry issues. First of all, constitutional carry or permitless carry is on the march across the country, and it's sort of reminiscent of when there was very difficult to get a permit anywhere mm -hmm. in the country, and then it first happened in Florida. Uh, Marion Hammer, the NRA, old NRA president, she really pushed that. That became uh, law in Florida, and then sort of uh, you know shall issue started mar started this march across the country so you, you know some, a lot of folks aren't old enough to remember that i'm an old man so right. i do remember that all right so it marched across the country and that's what i'm seeing happen with concealed with the constitutional permitless carry it's it's on that same march that you know it's interesting you're telling me about the reaction of the anti-gunners when it passes law they just give up and go to the next place because they're on defense at this point not offense and then because of bruin now if you're not permitless carry you have to be shall issue and there are obviously new york california there are states that are resisting it but they know the handwriting is on the wall and they're not going to be able to resist it very long so in that environment we're going to see a lot more folks carrying guns legally than we saw before what are your thoughts on how are you guys going to be busier with these kind of court cases or do you think it's going to have any effect on uh, your business or the volume of defensive shootings at all? I think certainly defensive shootings, uh, of course, you know how undercutting, uh, undercounting they are. When you brandish a firearm, that, that's a defensive use of a firearm, and, and we represent dozens of people that do that a year. We just had one last month in Massachusetts. Uh, I think because of Bruin and what's happening with, with uh, the march of Permitless Gary, sure, there's going to be more armed individuals out there, uh, so there's more opportunities, certainly, uh, for firearms to be used in self-defense. But notably, as in every state that's ever passed concealed carry, crime rate goes down. Because the bad guys, trust me, I spent, I, I spent the first 15 years of my legal career representing bad guys. People that I wouldn't even uh, uh, invite to a football game with me on the opposite side of the stadium, let alone to dinner. Uh, but in those people, they, they rob, they rape, they steal. That's what they do. But they still want to go home at night. They don't want to be killed. And the fact that uh, any individual that they come in contact with now could be armed and ready to defend their life has a huge impact back on it. If you go back and look at any state that's adopted uh, concealed carry, violent crime goes down. And it goes down throughout the United States, and it has been. So there will be uh, more opportunities for use of self-defense, obviously, with more people carrying. But I think that, that crime will reduce itself and and probably pretty much uh, it'll have a zero-sum game. But, well, and uh, it was sort of a softball question because I knew what the answer was, but I wanted to have somebody else say it besides me. <laughs> well, let's look at San Jose, shall we? I've been trying to avoid it because it's a pain in my butt, but I did print it out, and I looked at this idiotic ordinance. You've been an attorney a long time, Sean. What do you <laughs> think the chances of this thing actually surviving a constitutional challenge are? There, there's already lawsuits that have been filed, and I, I was actually shocked, Joel, when, when I had a second co-defense member uh, probably two weeks uh, contact me and said, hey, my buddy who was an insurance agent got this letter from the, the local sheriff in the mails telling them that, uh, that the San Jose Gun Harm Reduction Ordinance is in effect January 1st, and this is what you have to do if someone's looking for insurance. And guess and what? That insurance isn't available anywhere. It, you it can't buy anymore. it. <laughs> you can't buy it. And there's also going to be a fee that every gun owner has to pay that's going to go into a pool that's going to do something that we're unsure of. But guess what? They've never said what that fee's going to be. 
So, well, and watch this. Okay, so I love that. Now you should brought that up. All right. The des here's this in item C, okay, on page nine. The designated nonprofit organizational st- uh, organization whatever one they designate they haven't figured out what the fee is or who the organization is this thing's already become law <laughs> i know for a month okay <laughs> the designated nonprofit organization shall spend every dollar generated for the for, from the gun harm reduction fee and i love this minus administrative expenses exclusively for programs and initiatives designed to uh, reduce a reduce the risk of likelihood of harm from firearms and blah 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 okay minus administrative look if you go give a thousand dollars i'm going to pick on a trick i'm probably going to get in trouble here if you go pick on a send a thousand dollars to uh, a big charity. I'm not going to name one, but there's a bunch of them. You send it over there, and their administrative fees are about 98%. So now 2% of that check is actually going to get to the people that need it because they burn it up in administrative fees, which means you're going to be required to donate to a charity, <laughs> and it's going to burn up all your money and not do anything. Uh, so I'm glad you, you got that. Now, if you have, there are some exceptions. I want to point them out. Now, while mm-hmm. this thing is being dragged through court. Uh, police officers are exempt. People with concealed carry permits are exempt, at least as long as there's a concealed carry permit law, apparently. And those persons for, for whom they put for which, which is actually terrible English, those persons for whom compliance with the part uh, of this, uh, particular thing is a financial hardship, but they don't define financial har- What constitutes a financial hardship? They didn't bother to define it. So now you got me started. I'm sorry. I, I interrupted you. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, no, that's all right. Those are all things that, that I was going to point out too. You know, what's a financial hardship? How much money are you going to require me to pay? Uh, and the long and short of it was, he asked me. He said, "Is is my uh, second call defense uh, program does that cover me?" And I said, "Is contact your insurance agent in California, contact a local attorney in California, but I can give you the legal information that based on what I can garner from what they're asking for, yes." Second call defense, civil liability coverage that we have should comply with everything. But I can't uh, tell you for sure because they don't know for sure. <laughs> they haven't even defined what, okay, so compliance, right? You look under compliance. Or I'm looking under compliance and I'm going, what? All right, so here's the insurance requirement. This is what it says. This is all it says. This is it. Each person requires required to obtain and maintain insurance under this section shall demonstrate compliance with the insurance requirement by completing and, ex- and executing a city designated attestation form, which as far as I know has yet to be created and does not exist. I haven't seen it anywhere and I couldn't find there it, it anywhere. Oh, you got it? You got yeah, one. There's a, there's a link in the <laughs> sher- there's a link in the sheriff's letter. It's called a gun liability insurance attestation form. Okay. It'd be comp- compliant with the gun harm reduction ordinance gun owners and those in possession of guns must have a current homeowners renters or gun liability insurance policy for their firearms and ensure that the policy covers losses or damages resulting from accidental use of a firearm Um, but never nowhere does it say how much but it says specifically doesn't it right. Doesn't it use the word specifically mm-hmm. well, which means if i understand the word specifically which the root word of it is specify which means that in the insurance policy the policy has to specify that it does that i looked at my homeowner's insurance policy we have right. state state farm it ain't in there it's not in and there i have state farm <laughs> and as far as i know it ain't in any of them well so and, right yeah <laughs> Yeah, so, I mean, that's why I, I tried to, uh, obviously, I'm not licensed in California. I'm licensed well, no, in federal I know, I courts, but, right. but so I, I, I looked at, it, got, when I got their gun liability insurance at the station form, it was hilarious. I mean, it goes on, it, and it has a thing at the, on the back that, um, that yeah, talks about that. household size and household income uh, and, and medium income for an additional persons over eight at $4,050. I have no idea what this charge is for. They don't say what it's for. But maybe that's so they can figure out whether you are a person who is going to suffer financial hardship. Right. But they don't define what the financial. Is yeah, that well, just, that, what do they do? Look at the form and then throw a dart to see if they can. Well, if they, they, they financial list hardship? medium incomes on here, but they, they never. Again, like you said, there's no there's no requirement to have anything for what income. 
Well, I don't well, know. Well, not only that, if it's you may have an income that's that's X, but if you have bills that are X plus five, you you're suffering a hardship if you got to go buy coffee. So, <laughs> I mean, right? Yeah. And, uh, then it's interesting to me in the look in the compliance thing that you know you, you complete this form and you put it with your guns. And you got to keep it with your gun if you and have to keep it gun. with the guns in the safe or whatever, yeah. and that's it. And then if some cop, uh, you know, who has nothing else to do, <laughs> right, in a world in which there aren't enough cops and crime is going up, if some cop who is just bored out of his or her gourd decides to ask you to see the form because they know or suspect that you might own a gun, then you have to show them the form. Now, what is the likelihood of that actually happening when police are running around like chickens with their heads cut off trying to deal with the crime in San Jose to begin with? Doesn't make any sense. Well, and what's interesting is, is the letter to the Oh, I didn't see agency. that. You, you got yeah, a letter. To, okay. To the insurance agency from the sheriff's department states that if you don't have your insurance attestation form with the gun, you're subject to a $250 fine. Now... I couldn't find that in the statute anywhere. The only place I could find that was on the letter to the insurance agent. So I don't know. I don't know. Looks no, like I did see something in the statute where they could confiscate your gun, but I forget where that is. And that, I forget the, I couldn't, I, I looked again and I couldn't spot it. It's a brief little reference here. Uh, oh, here it is here. Okay. Impoundment. It's on page 12 of this, of the statute. And it says, to the extent allowed by law, the firearm or firearms of a person that is not in compliance with this statute, says this part, the statute may be impounded subject to a due process hearing. So I guess they got to have a due process hearing first, and then they can impound your gun. So this is just a, you know, it's a, it's a money grab. It's a registration attempt. We want to find out who owns guns in San Jose. And it's a way to, to take your guns away without you having committed a crime. They just made you a criminal if you don't fill out this stupid form. And if you don't buy insurance that is not available, you cannot buy it. So I, the, the courts have already decided, and I believe the Supreme Court among them, haven't they, that you cannot require someone to purchase an insurance product that does not exist. That's correct. And, and even more the issue of requiring an insurance to exercise a constitutional right. Uh, that that's, so I guess our firearm is treated differently because you have to have an insurance policy for that. But what about for the Bible that I have in my desk do, for my first amendment rights? So I have to have an insurance policy to make sure that I don't incite a riot with other religions based upon my Catholic faith. And uh, it, it's strange. So, this is the stupidity and idiocy of this kind of stuff. This is a, this is a, a constitutionally protected, God-given, natural right. You know what's really scary? Is a law director drafted this. You know, I read, some, I, yeah, I read somewhere where you contact a law director if you have any questions. So I'm not, I'd like to find out where the law director went to school. Yeah, I, I don't know. You know, maybe he went to he got his law degree out of a Cracker Jack box. I don't know. Well, okay. So that's the question: is what do you, what do you think? I mean, do you think this is? I don't think this has got a snowball's chance, and you know where of surviving constitutional challenges. No, at all. I, I, and I agree with you one hundred percent. I'm I'm just hopeful that someone doesn't get arrested and someone doesn't have to try to defend themselves and pay for an attorney uh, for, for this this what I to be be a useless garbage. Uh, now, I, I didn't check, and apparently you did. You said there are already some lawsuits on this? Yeah, there's, uh, I believe, the Second Amendment Foundation filed a lawsuit, and uh, uh, maybe Gun Owners of America also did um, a month ago. There's a couple of them filed, uh, I think, almost immediately. But what, what's funny is they're, they're, they're going to enforce a law that went into effect January 1st that parts of it don't exist yet. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean... You, you, you're going to make me buy a product as of January 1st. You didn't even bother to make sure that the product was available. It's not. No. It's not. <laughs> you know, I've actually talked to a couple of insurance agents because I knew we were going to talk about this. And they're like, what? 
<laughs> and you'd think they'd be excited to sell a product and to make some if more money. If they had one. <laughs> yeah. so it was like it's requiring me to buy a widget that the, it hasn't been invented yet. It doesn't, and by the way, I'm going to arrest you if you don't have one in your pocket, <laughs> right? That's nuts. Well, so if you're in San Jose and you're watching this and you've got, you know, you're freaking out. Boy, do I get it. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. But this is, I... I'm just going to tell you this is my this is my layman's opinion and I got an attorney here with you know decades of experience. This is not going to survive. It's going to get killed in court and uh, and if San Jose doesn't decide to pull it anyway because they don't want to go through the court battle it'll go wherever it goes it gets expensive after a while we'll see. But hang in there. I and I will check and see if I can figure out who's suing and see if I can get you some information. If I can find it, I'll put it in the description for you. Well, Sean, is there, oh, one thing I wanted you to mention now, because I know you're having some trouble with your, in case somebody right. wants to sign up for Second Call Defense, you're having some trouble with your uh, membership application form on your website. So yeah, uh, give them a way to reach you. Uh, we have Rockwood is our insurance administrator. They handle the insurance end of it. We're not insurance agents or companies, and so we can't do that. They handle uh, all the documentation, all the paperwork, and they're the insurance people. Their uh, website was attacked. Uh, viciously, and they've had to rebuild everything. And not only do they uh, work for Second Call Defense, but dozens of other insurance companies. So because of all the, the privacy issues, the SEC materials that, that they're in charge of also, the FBI's been involved. Uh, and I just want to tell everybody who was a member of Second Call Defense, none of our information w was, uh, was targeted. None of it was harmed. They couldn't get to it. We have so many firewalls surrounding our information that they couldn't get to that. Uh, so we're, our members are safe and all their information is safe, but if you want to sign up, there's no way for you to do it online right now because our website is moments away from being put back up. In fact, if you can log on, but as soon as you click on plans and pricing, you'll get a message that, uh, hold on, you can't do it yet. But I have a phone number and that's 877-502-3300. That's 877-502-3300. And that's Rockwood, and they are answering the phones. So if you have any questions about that, uh, you can call Rockwood, and they'll sign you up. They can they can do that uh, over the phone, and uh, and be able to answer all your questions. If you have any questions for me, my cell phone number is 513-484-0142, and it's on 24 hours a day. But uh, I'm on Eastern Time, so give me a break. But if you have to call me at two or three in the morning, I guess you have to call me at two or three in the morning. But I'll be happy to answer any questions for you also. I just want to ask you at like 3 o'clock in the morning, what's the meaning of life or some stupid question like that? <laughs> John, thank you very much for coming on the show. I really do appreciate it, my friend. I hope you have a wonderful week, and I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Well, Joe, thank you so much for having me. And, again, I appreciate everything you do for it. It's absolutely my pleasure. Stay safe. Thank you again for watching all the way through the interviews. I realize these interviews can be long, but, you know, the information is pretty important. So we, we, we don't care if we make them long. That's kind of the way it goes. So I do apologize for the length, though. I try to keep them short. This one, we had a lot of interesting things to talk about. Uh, if you have any questions about Second Call Defense, I will put those phone numbers in the link, go ahead, uh, in the description, rather, so that you can check them out. I'll also put a link to their website there because at some point it's going to come back up again. Uh, this has actually happened to my company where we had a vendor that it, their website got attacked and we didn't lose any customer information, but as a result, it took them like a month to get the stupid thing back up again. And unfortunately, people thought we'd gone belly up as a company when we hadn't. We, you know, we have, we're plenty of money. We're in good shape. And that's where Second Call Defense is right now. They're not in any trouble. They're not going belly up. They just had a vendor that had a problem with the website. So it's going to get repaired. Don't worry about it. If you would like to support the channel, I urge you to do that. And that is you can join uh, Gun Guy TV crew and... And that's where you're going to find things that you can't find anywhere else because I put a lot of exclusive content up there. There is a link for that in the description as well. Thank you again for everything you do. Have a wonderful week. And wherever you go, whatever you do, stay safe.